This is a Faith Defenders audio presentation. This evening, I want to deal with the subject of cultic apologetics. We have finished our basic survey of a philosophic apologetic, that is a defense of Christianity against comparative philosophic systems. This evening, I want us to think for a few minutes about the evangelization of the world of the cults. And next week, we'll be dealing with the evangelization or the apologetics in terms of the occult. Now, the world of the cults is a fascinating subject. Having just returned from the Spiritual Counterfeits Conference in California, it is estimated there are probably 5,000 cults operating in the United States alone. These cults can range from a few individual to multiple millions. These cults are continuing to mushroom on every hand. There are UFO cults. There are cults gathered around the worship of the egg. There are cults gathered around the worship of bugs. There are cults gathered around the worship of an individual whom they claim to be none other than Jesus Christ or God manifested in the flesh. In the midst of the pluralism that we are faced with today, how can the Christian possibly make his or her way through the swamp and the morass of the cultic literature that we are, find today on every hand? Well, the first thing that we must do is to define what we mean by the word cult. A cult is a religious organization founded by and built upon the teachings of a central religious leader whose authority is viewed as being equal to or greater than the Bible and whose teachings are in opposition to the theology of historic Christianity. There are four basic elements in this definition of the word cult uh, that are very important. First of all, a cult should be and must be a religious organization. It cannot simply be an organization which has been established to avoid paying taxes to Uncle Sam. There are various degree mill institutions which will give you an ordination to make you a clergyman for $10. They will even sell you a DD, that is, make you a doctor of divinity if you want to pay them 50 bucks. There's an entire town in Upper New York where every single citizen wrote off and has now received their ordinations through the mail. They promptly declared the entire town as exempt non-profit religious property. So the county is having fits, the state is having fits, because it would seem to be that no taxes will be forthcoming from that entire community whatsoever. The IRS is very interested in this particular point. If a group is simply created to avoid the paying of taxes or is a fraudulent group which has been created for the sole purpose of conning people out of their money, then those organizations should not be protected by those laws which are in favor of religious organizations. Of course, this has ended up in a and a very, very sticky mess at the present time. Groups such as Scientology have been accused of being organizations that are out simply to take money off of people. It costs about $40,000 to be cleared of the evil engrams of your past incarnational experiences. If you wish to go all the way with Scientology, uh, it is expected that an individual could well spend 100 to $150,000. When you think of uh, uh, attending your church and giving in the sum that you give in on the plate, realize that there are groups which demand as much as $40,000 in terms of the initial payments. And you see here people are willing to spend immense amounts of money when they could have salvation through Jesus Christ through nothing. Also, it's not only a religious organization, but it is a religious organization founded by and built upon the teachings of a central religious leader. Now, this is very, very important. If you want to deal with yoga, the movement of yoga or TM in this country, you would have to deal 
with the figure of Maharishi Yogi. If you're going to deal with the Moonies, you're going to have to deal with Reverend Moon. Or with the Mormons, it would be Joseph Smith. Or with one of the more aggressive Indian groups of our day, you will have to deal with Rajanish and his attempts uh, to bring people into enlightenment uh, through sexual orgasm and violence. And you see, all of these different cultic groups will have one particular person, a man or a woman, who was viewed as the leader or the founder, the deity, or in some way or the other, the cult is based entirely upon that person. Now, what is unique about this person is that their authority is viewed as being equal to or greater than the Bible. Their authority is viewed as being equal to or greater than God or the same as God's authority. When you have an individual who says, I am God, you're dealing with someone uh, who is making some very stupendous claims. And usually they say, I am God, give me your money. <laughs> And of course, I hate to say it, we're living in a time when those individuals are getting the money and they are rolling in it and their wealth is, is to be viewed as shocking when you compare their lifestyle with that of Jesus Christ. Rajanish, who says, poverty is a sign that you have never been enlightened. So he enjoys his limousines and his yachts. He enjoys the fine clothing. One man who was a member of his cult for many years and then came to a saving knowledge of Christ gave his testimony in San Diego. And he went to Rajanish and he simply pointed out an astute observation. Jesus of Nazareth was poor and yet he was the greatest of the enlightened ones. How could Rajanish say Jesus was enlightened, Jesus was a great incarnation? When Jesus was poor, he never built people out of their money and was never into sex. Now since Rajanish is into milking the public in more ways than one, it was extremely difficult for him to handle the problem of Jesus Christ. But you see these religious figures are viewed as being authorities and their authority knows no equal upon earth or in heaven. And their theology or their teachings, their doctrines are in opposition to the theology of historic Christianity. Now the word cultic as opposed to the word cult can have two different meanings. First, a cult may be cultic in, in an organizational sense. That is the members of that particular group look to their founder or leader as God's voice on earth. Within the structure of that cult no one is allowed to question the authority or the teachings of the leader. Why? To question the leader's authority is to question God's authority. To reject the teaching of that leader is to reject the teaching of God. So the cultists will look to their leaders uh, for all truth and guidance. And some of the uh, more disciplined cults, uh, they will tell you when to go to bed and when to get up. As a matter of fact, as a, as a basic scheme within some of your more mind-manipulative cults, they make a point of keeping everyone in the state of sleep deprivation. They will allow you four hours of sleep. Now that gives you enough so that you can physically function but not enough that you may mentally function. They also deprive you of proper nutrition. They make sure that you have a low protein diet. You are therefore kept in a physical and mental state in which you are incapable of rational thought. Much has been made of the fact that within some of the larger groups like the Moonies, males stop growing beards. Once you become a Mooney and get involved, all you fellows can simply put away your razors. You won't need them. The women stop their menstrual cycles. They simply cease. When you deprive people of sleep and of food, 
there is a hormonal imbalance that is created and women will have extreme problems, particularly when it deals with the menstrual cycle and the men will stop growing beards. Also, with some of the other groups uh, who give you a diet uh, that is very, very dangerous, uh, you will experience extreme pains of diarrhea. And of course, the cults are not stupid. They've been in the business for years. So they explain to the woman as she comes in, to the girl, that as you grow closer to God, he will remove your sexual urges and your menstrual cycle will cease because you were coming close to God. And they will tell the men, the reason your beards will not grow is that you're becoming a child again, a child of God. And then one particular Indian guru who fed his people a diet of white rice, creating berry berry and a few other goodies, told his people that as you take my diet, you will be purged of all the evil thinking and it will come out of you. And because you're full of it, it will be coming out. So as they run off for their diarrhea, it's made to be a proof of the system. So they tell them ahead of time that there are going to be these drastic changes within the organizational structure of the cult. And you see, the leader's authority is viewed as being the foundation or the source of all authoritative teaching. Now, thus a group can be cultic in organization, but basically Christian in theology. Some scholars view the movement called the Bible Speaks as being such a group, or the community of Jesus, both of which have snatched people right in Carlisle, as a matter of fact. But within those particular groups which are quasi-evangelical, that is, if you ask them, do you believe in being born again? Yes. Do you believe in the Trinity? Yes. But you see, they're headed up by father so-and-so or mother so-and-so, and they call her Mother Jane. And Mother Jane will tell you when to get up, when to go to bed. Mother Jane will tell you to whether or not you're going to go out to work. There is an absolute authority structure in which no one had better uh, question Brother Stephen or Pastor Stevens in the Bible Speaks movement. And you have people uh, who have pointed out that they have the documents, particularly in a group like Bible Speaks, where the leader would stand up and say, I am the shepherd. I am God so far as you are concerned. Many people used to say, oh, I wish I could walk with Jesus. Well, walk with me and you'll walk with Jesus. And you see, even though there's many elements of evangelical teaching, yet the organizational structure is cultic in character. The same thing, I'm afraid, must be said of the shepherding movement within the charismatic uh, movement itself. The idea that you will hand over your mind and your life for individuals to control. So a group may be cultic in an organizational sense without necessarily being heretical in theology. All it takes is for a church or for an organization to lay all authority in the hands of an individual or group of individuals. So you can have a church and where the pastor says, I have been sent from God, and you people had better believe me. So when the pastor wants to do something and the elders or deacons don't want to do it, if the pastor says, well, I have the authority in this church, regardless if he understands it or not, he is bordering on the line of creating a cult. But then secondly, a group may be cultic in a theological sense as well as in an organizational sense. All cults are cultic in organization, though all cults are not cultic in theology. Now, most of the groups which are cults are heretical when it comes to theology. They deny such teachings as the Trinity, the deity of Christ, Christ's bodily resurrection, etc., and you have to beware of the problem of deception. In a recent magazine article, which I just read uh, 
yesterday, there was a letter sent in from an editor of a newspaper, and he simply said, I was very shocked that you allowed the statement that Mormons are not Christ are Christians to appear in your newspaper. Don't you realize that the Mormon church is a Christian church, just like the Methodists and the Presbyterians? They state, quote, we believe in one eternal father, end quote. Therefore, they are Christian. I have in mind to write the gentleman to point out several things. Number one, according to Mormon theology, the father is not eternal. He was once a mortal man who became God. So when they say we believe in one eternal father, you have to take your pen and scratch out the word eternal. Also, the Mormons believe in billions of gods, so you need to scratch out the word one, and you need to scratch out the word father. What they're really saying is that we are polytheists, we believe in many gods, and all the gods were spirit babies at one time and became mortal men and women who went on to deity. They are not talking about the Christian idea of the fatherhood of God. But you see, they deceive people by making a statement which on the surface will look like what Christianity teaches. If someone tells you, I believe in Jesus, don't buy it until you ask them to define it. You must remember that the Apostle Paul stated in 2 Corinthians 11, there are many Jesuses, there are many Gospels, and there are many spirits. Just because someone's dancing and prancing, saying they have the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues, and they're talking about praising Jesus, does not mean they have the right spirit or the right Jesus or the right tongues. You must beware of being deceived by cultic groups who do not want to tell you the truth to begin with. There is some legislation that is actually being worked on that would force religious groups to tell you up front what they really believe and what they really want from you. I assure you that if all the women who went into Roshanis ashram and got raped were told ahead of time that they're going to experience reality at the moment of greatest fear in the midst of a rape scene, I don't think they would be running and spending $3,000 at the ashram to get raped. And, but see, this is the problem. People are not told ahead of time what they're expected to believe or what they're expected to do for the cult. Now, in the past, most of the evangelical labor in refuting the cults has focused on refuting the theology of cultic groups point by point. We have had to defend the theology of historic Christianity and to refute all of the cultic doctrines. So we would deal uh, particularly with the teachings of the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Moonies or the Krishnas and refute point by point what they teach concerning man, concerning God, concerning the world, and concerning Christ. What I want us to do tonight is to focus our attention on an underlying problem which was not dealt with to any great extent in the past works and studies on the subjects of the cults. What I want us to deal with is the issue of the organization itself, the organizational structure, that foundational problem which underlies the problem of the theology of the cults. When we begin to deal with this, we are, of course, dealing with the issue of religious authority. For religious authority is the most basic problem that we face as we seek to communicate the gospel with other people. If you witness to someone who's a rationalist, they will appeal to their reason as being the religious authority. If you deal with the Roman Catholic, they will view the Catholic Church as being the great authority. If you are dealing with a cultic structure or a cultic person, they will view the cult or the cultic leader as having the ultimate authority. Religious authority is the foundation of the cult, while the theology of the cult must be viewed as a superstructure. 
the religious authority is and must be viewed as being the roots while the teachings are the fruit. And we must understand that the teachings of a cult rely solely on the validity of the religious authority upon which that cult is built and not vice versa. One thing Christian people must understand, and they have great difficulty in grasping this, is this particular point. Most Christians approach this subject assuming that if something is true, it's authoritative. Because the Bible is true, it's authoritative. Because Christ was truly the Messiah, he is authoritative. Whereas the cultist approaches the subject entirely backwards. Something is true if it comes from authoritative source. So instead of beginning by saying, well, if it's true, then it's authoritative, they assume, well, it's authoritative, therefore it's true. Thus, the Christian and the cultists simply ride by each other because they approach the issue from entirely different perspectives. The Christian comes up to the cultist and says, hey, is it true you deny that Jesus is God? Yes, we do. Well, let me prove to you that the doctrine is true. Now, see, the cultist isn't on that wavelength. He believes that Christ is Michael the archangel or a perfect man because the cultic leader said so. What is authoritative is true. It doesn't matter to him whether or not the doctrine is true or false. It doesn't matter how many verses you show him. If the authority has said it, then it must be true. That which is authoritative is true. And it really doesn't matter what the cultic person may say. They may say, thinking of your mind manipulative groups, they will tell you there is no pain. There is no evil. There is no suffering. As a matter of fact, reality is not something you can see with the eyes or touch with the hands. Ultimate reality is somewhere beyond this veil of illusion that we are now confronted by. And they will tell you the most absurd things that has no relationship whatsoever to life. But you see, they can get away with it because the authority of the group is based in an individual. Now, some of the cultic leaders are using techniques of mass hypnosis and ventilation at the same time in order to gain the allegiance of the converts. We have tapes, and there are even some films of exactly how this technique is used. They will get a crowd together in a motel room or a hotel room, and you will get them singing, and then you get them shouting. You get them breathing. You say, your problem, said one cultic leader, is your problem is this. You are not breathing in the divine. You are not breathing out the undivine. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. And he gets you hyperventilating where he raises the oxygen in your blood level that it affects your mind and you begin to get giddy. Then as you're breathing, and he gets you breathing, he gets everyone breathing at the same rhythm. And then all of a sudden you begin to talk this way. I mean to tell you that truth is all. All is God. God is all. We must see that this is the way to find the truth today. And you find that they then match the rhythm of their words according to your breathing patterns. Within 5 to 15 minutes, they have you hyperventilating, giddy, and in a hypnotic trance. And you think before you're through that what they're saying is the greatest thing in the world. Do you know why? You feel fantastic. You feel giddy. What they're saying sounds so good. Why? Because your brain, you see, has been saturated with oxygen. Or in another cultic structure, they have used nutrition as a weapon. What they do is deprive you of sleep and deprive you of food, but 
They reward you with candy and they load you up with candy. The end result, you're utterly stupefied. And along comes the leader, who is the picture of health and vitality, and you'll follow him. You will follow him because you are in a dazed state where you'll follow anybody or anything. And you see, for them, the issue is not well, if this thing is true, therefore it's authoritative. But no, is it authoritative? Did so and so say it? Well, then it's true. And this, you see, brings us to the great problem we face in cultic evangelism. They assume to be true what they have yet to prove. So the Mormon says, I believe that Joseph Smith is a true prophet of God. And that because he's a true prophet of God, he never gave any false prophecies. So you show them one. Then you show them two. There are approximately 64 false prophecies of Joseph Smith. You could go through all 64, and what do you get from the average Mormon? Well, I don't know how to answer this, but they can't be false prophecies because Joseph Smith was the true prophet of God. You can't help but be remembered of the man who thought he had died. And his wife took him to the physician to prove that he was alive, and the physician convinced him that dead men don't bleed. And then he took the man's finger and pricked it and squeezed out a drop of blood. And the guy looked at it and said, Why? Dead men do bleed. Dead men do bleed. You see, this is what's difficult in the mindset of the cultic structures. They think something is true simply because it comes from the authoritative source. Thus, the problem we face is this. How can we discredit the religious authority upon which a cult is built or upon which it depends? This is not a question of refuting doctrines one by one, but this is actually dealing with the religious authority itself. Now, this brings out the important part that the Holy Spirit has to play when it comes to the issue of cultic evangelism. If you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, you will discover that the root problem is not intellectual, but it is spiritual. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says, starting at verse 3, If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Why is it that individuals may look at you and they've just heard you tell them the truth? So-and-so is a false prophet. So-and-so is a quack. So-and-so is a sexual pervert. So-and-so is a thief. And they will not believe you because... There is a spiritual veil over the eyes. There is a spiritual problem that is taking place here and that we cannot simply trust any given method as being the only hope of getting these cultists out of the cult. At the conference, we had many different speakers presenting many different methods all in the context of the fact that you try one and if it doesn't work, you try the other method. There isn't a sure proof or surefire method beyond that of actually kidnapping a person and deprogramming them. Now that also was discussed. And of course, there were individuals there who gave their testimony of how it was only because their parents arranged their kidnapping and they were deprogrammed was the only reason they got out of the cult. For you see, once the person was given food, once the person was allowed to sleep, just those two things in itself caused the person to wake up out of that hypnotic trance, which was nutritionally related to starving the brain of the amino acids. And all of a sudden the person would wake up. All they needed was some decent food and some sleep and they were out of the cult. But even that does not work surefire for their individuals who've been deprogrammed who have returned to the cult. Not because they were hypnotized, but because they found something in the cult that they wanted. 
a found security, a found love, they found money, they found sex, or whatever it was, that they like it and they go back to it. As the scripture says, a dog returning to his vomit to eat it up again. Yet we must deal with this issue of the religious authority upon which the cults are based. Let me point out, as we begin to develop this particular method, one method, uh, that attacks on the personal character or morals of the cultic leader does not seem to have any effect upon cult members whatsoever. You can point out that Joseph Smith was a sexual pervert who had 42 concubines. You can point out all that these cultic leaders have done. But since you're only attacking their character and not disproving their authority, the cultic structure remains. So it's better just to leave those skeletons in the closet. The Christians can discuss such things and the historians can write them down. But basically, the argumentum ad hominem, that is discrediting the character of someone, is not going to be very effective. What we must do in terms of our own method is to realize that we need to deal with the claim that the leader has that he is God's prophet, God's voice, God's authority, or even that he claims to be God or Jesus Christ. This claim is the basis of his authoritative teaching. And how can we discredit such religious claims? Well, most American cults claim to have an allegiance to the Bible. Now, this will not, of course, relate to those mind-manipulative movements such as the Human Potential Movement, EST, LifeSpring, uh, or various of the group therapies. Neither will this apply to the occultic groups from India and from the East uh, who are interested primarily in teaching Hinduism. They will not have any allegiance to the Bible whatsoever. But when you're dealing with those cults which are primarily American indigenous cults, you will find that, generally speaking, they will pay lip service to the Bible. With this fact in mind, you ask them to read Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22. Now, in Deuteronomy, Moses had just prophesied that they should not be involved in cultic or occultic prophecies because they are an abomination unto God. As a matter of fact, the Canaanites were being thrown out of the land for practicing sorcery and divination, and this he mentions in verse 14. Instead of running to the witches and to the mediums, instead of running off to the cultic and occultic leaders of his own day, Moses says, listen, you need to go to the God of Israel. And if you think you need somebody, well, God is going to raise up one day a prophet. And this prophet will come and he will have the final truth. Now, of course, the New Testament picks this up to refer to Jesus Christ the Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah of Israel, that prophet who was to come. Having stated that the Lord God will raise up a prophet, verse 18, it is only natural uh, that they would be concerned about identifying this prophet as opposed to all the false prophets who are running around. Thus, in verse 20, he says a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, must be put to death. Notice what it says. Within the theocratic organization, false prophets were not given shingles and put out and had large buildings dedicated to their memory and to their organization. Neither were they handed a lot of money. They were swiftly taken care of. But verse 21, but you will say to yourself, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? Here we have different individuals who claim to be prophets. Well, how will we know when the wooden nickel comes down the road? The answer is given. If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true. That is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously 
do not be afraid of him. As a matter of fact, we were told in the previous verse that that prophet should be put to death. Now, the logic is very simple. If someone claims that he or she is God's prophet or God's authority on earth, one way to test this claim is to examine any predictions they have made. If their predictions fail, you must come to the conclusion they are, that they are false prophets and their claims must be rejected as spurious. And it only takes one false prophecy or prediction to prove someone to be a false prophet. Now, of course, it's only obvious that if you're dealing with a cult whose leader never made any predictions and never predicts any things about the future, this is not the approach that you're going to be able to take. Or again, in some cases, uh, let's say the cultic person has only made one prediction in his whole life and it happened to have come true. Well, then how do you deal with the cultic group who would say our leader is God's prophet because he predicted uh, an airplane crash and it came true? Well, turn to Deuteronomy 13. If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a miraculous sign or wonder, here is someone coming down the pike. They appear. Hey, I am God's prophet. And I'm going to prove it to you people. I'm going to give you a sign. I'm going to predict something. And if the sign or wonder of which he has spoken takes place, and he says, let us follow other gods, that is gods you have not known, and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow, and him you must revere. Keep his commandments and obey him. Serve him and hold fast to him. That prophet or dreamer must be put to death because he preached rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. He has tried to turn you from the way the Lord your God commanded you to follow. You must purge the evil from among you. Well, you see, the fact of a fulfilled prediction does not prove anybody's credentials. And may I remark at this point that a healing does not prove anything? I have heard very foolish, ignorant people saying, Well, I believe she's of God because she healed people. All healing comes from God. How many of you have ever heard the statement, all healing comes from God? That is the biggest lie you would ever want to hear. Just because someone can heal, speak in tongues, fly through the air, or predict the future, does not mean they are from God. And here Moses simply said, if you can't find a false prophecy, then check their theology. If the theology is unbiblical, then the presence of a fulfilled prophecy will not establish the validity of that cultic authority. Thus, a cultic group can be discredited by failed predictions or by false teachings. Either way, the Word of God has given us the wherewithal to refute and to deal with the pluralistic confusion that we have in the world of the cults. Well, what then is this basic method in terms of using false prophecies or using predictions? Well, in those cults which have conveniently hung themselves by predicting things for the future, we can point out with absolute assurity that they have discredited their religious authority because these predictions did not come true. This is true of the Mormons, since Joseph Smith had 64 prophecies that failed. The average Mormon will dance, will rationalize, and will do everything he or she can to prevent making that fatal emission that Joseph Smith was not a true prophet of God. 
The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, in its hundred years of existence, has consistently set the date for the end of the world, and that date has not happened. Armstrong of the radio program, The World Tomorrow, showed he was a false prophet by his booklet entitled 1975. Alan G. White of the Adventists set dates for the second coming of Jesus Christ. These dates failed. The Moonies looked forward to 1981 as the time in which the whole world would recognize Reverend Moon as the Lord of the Second Advent. Instead, he's just been indicted by a grand jury for tax evasion. So much for that particular theory. As you go through the different cultic structures, you will realize that the leader began to drink the heady wine of deity. He or she would get to the point where they really thought, perhaps, that they were God. And because of that, they would make that final mistake of predicting the end of the world. Take the material that you have, dealing particularly with the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses, and realize that this same method can be applied to the Adventists, to the Moonies, and to a plethora of other cultic groups who have set dates and predicted things that have not come to pass. The Apostle Paul warned in Acts chapter 20 that the elders of the church must be very, very careful and very alert to the coming problem of the cults. In Acts chapter 20, in verse 28, he says, Guard yourselves, speaking to the elders of the church, and all the flock of God of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come among you and will not spare the flock. False teachers will come from without side in order to ravage the church. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. I would encourage you to buy The Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin, which will go through, I think, at least 18 of the cults that are particularly numerous in our own day, and for you to be prepared to give an answer to those who would question you about the hope that you have within you.